to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We welcome you today to our study of Satan, the enemy of God and the enemy of man. We hope that you've got your, got your Bible handy, that you've got it with you. If you don't have it, we want to encourage you to take a moment to find your Bible and get it out as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study about the nature of Satan today. We're so glad. So glad that you've joined us for our Bible study. And uh, as always, we want you to know today's lessons are being brought to you by individual members and congregations of the Church of Christ. We encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area. You'll find people there who love God, who are concerned about the truth, and who would be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you. If you've got a Bible question, you want to know more about the plan of salvation, the nature of the church, worship, whatever your question may be, you'll find people there who'd be happy to sit down and in love just open up the Scriptures and see what God has to say. And so we encourage you to visit their assembly on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday for Bible study. You won't be disappointed if you do. And friend, we also want to help you in your desire to know God and His will better in your life, we want to help you here at the Gospel of Christ. Our whole mission at the Gospel of Christ is just simply to take the whole pure Gospel to the whole world. We encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our media. We have books on every, uh, we have uh, lessons on every book of the Old Testament, lessons on every book in the New Testament, as well as a large variety of topical studies, written material, transcripts, study questions, just a great resource to supplement your study of the Word of God as well. And so check out our website. If you'd like to have a copy of this series on Satan, we'll make that available to you. Go to our website, fill out our media request form. We can send you a download download instantaneously, or if you need a CD to listen to or a DVD to watch, we can put that in the mail to you as well. And friend, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app available in the Play Stores both for the Android and iPhone. It's a great way to find out about our newest lessons, get updates on things we're doing, and as well as study the Word of God on your phone in the fast-paced world that we lived in today. And so check out the Gospel of Christ app as well. Today in this lesson, we're thinking about the appearances of Satan in Scripture and the names that Satan is called by that help us understand both what he is doing and how God describes him, what his nature is like in the Bible. And so we begin by thinking about, just chronologically, let's think for a few moments about where do I first start seeing Satan at in the Bible? And let's open, first of all, to the first appearance of Satan found in Genesis chapter 3. The first appearance of Satan in Scripture is in the Garden of Eden. Notice, this, notice with me Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. Here's what we find about the enemy. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows in the day you eat of it your eyes will be opened, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then 
The eyes of both of them were opened. They knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together, made themselves coverings, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called out to Adam and said, Where are you? So Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you you shall not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go. You shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the original appearance of Satan where he tempts Adam and Eve, and of course, they give in to that sin. As a result, sin, death, and of course, the seeds of salvation enter into the world here. The devil's fate is also sealed. The seed of woman is going to crush, deal a death blow, the head of Satan, which Paul says in Romans 16, 20, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Now, we know this serpent is the devil. For Revelation 12, verse 9 tells us that. But here the devil is simply referred to as the serpent, which as we said is identified as the devil in Revelation 12, verse 9, and in Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. And so from this original scene, also identified as Jesus <clears throat> from this text, and we also realize that the devil is identified as a murderer from the beginning. John chapter 8, verse 44. And so what he said, the lies he told, led to the murder, led to the death. He killed. He brought death to God's creation. But here's what I want you to think about. Why is a serpent mentioned here? Why is the devil likened unto a serpent? My friend, I don't know about you, but a serpent will scare people to death. It's cunning. It's slithery. It sends chills down your spine just to think about it. It'll get up on you before you know it. You ever been somewhere and you look down and you almost stepped on a snake? Well, you talk, cause a man to have a heart attack nearly. The sly, the, on top of you before you know it, the, 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 the bite you on the ankle type of idea and do harm. All of that's represented by the serpent here. And look at what he did. He lied, he deceived, he caused doubt, he opened the door for man to face the, the death penalty of eating the tree that God told them not to. This first appearance of Satan sees him wreaking havoc on God's plan and on God's creation. He hates God and he hates man. He can't destroy God because God's more powerful than him, and so he's going to do everything possible from this point out to the end of time. He's going to do everything possible to harm God's creation, and that's his ultimate motive here and throughout time in history. Secondly, the second account we see of Satan in Scripture is found in the book of Job. I want you to open with me to Job chapter 1 and 2, and let's get another picture of Satan as he is mentioned in the Bible. Open your Bible to the first chapter of the book of Job, and here's what we find in Job chapter 1, beginning in verse number 6. The Bible says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear you, fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him? around his household, around all that he has on every side. You've blessed the work of his hand. His possessions have increased in the land. But now, 
Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to his face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. We're presented with this heavenly counsel, for lack of a better word, and Satan comes before God as well. God quizzes Satan here. Where have you been? What have you been doing? And Satan says, I've been going to and fro, back and forth on the earth. What have you been, you've just been down there taking a little stroll in essence? We know by God's next question what he's doing. Have you considered my servant Job? When Satan was going to and fro, back and forth on the earth, what was he doing? He was doing what the lion does, seeking those he may devour. 1 Peter 5 verse 8, he was actively, aggressively looking for people to tempt and destroy, just like in Genesis chapter 3. And thus, Satan has been going back and forth looking for people to destroy. Job is here offered up as one who follows God. And Satan immediately begins to cast, cast doubt on God and cast doubt on why Satan, Job, serves him. And so Satan is permitted by God to tempt him. We know Satan, uh, Job, passes that test and proves that a man will serve God for nothing, but there's a couple of lessons I want you to see here about Satan and the second appearance in the Bible. This is the first usage of the name Satan in the Bible. Literally, it means the adversary. Sons of God come before him and the adversary comes. The adversary of who? The adversary of God. And by what we see in the context, the adversary of man. Man is God's pinnacle of creation. God breathed in the man the breath of life. And Satan is trying to destroy and tempt and cause man to be lost. Anything that does harm to God's prized possession that God breathed His Spirit into also is the enemy of God. And so Satan is the adversary, carries the idea of the opponent, the enemy, one who is in an adversarial role trying to thwart and destroy and bring down something else. Friend, realize up front, Satan's evil. He's the enemy. He's the adversary. All the intents of his heart are always on evil. He's looking to destroy everything about God's possess God's creation, mankind that He can. He wants through us to do as much harm to God as is humanly possible. But then consider this about Satan as well. He's as militant and aggressive and active in his role, probably more than we can begin to imagine. Where have you been? Going to and fro back on the earth? Well, what's that mean? Have you considered my servant Job? Satan is actively, aggressively, in a militant fashion, looking for people to tempt every day. He is actively trying to destroy God's creation and cause us harm. Let's then think about the third appearance we see of Satan in Scripture. Would you open your Bible with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 21? The third time that we see an appearance of Satan in the Bible chronologically is found in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. I know the book of Job comes after 1 Chronicles, but chronologically, Job and the events thereof would happen back during the time of the book of Genesis, toward the end of Genesis, most likely. And so 1 Chronicles 21, verse number 1, look at what the Bible says. Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab, to the leaders of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan. Bring the number of them to me that I may know. And of course, as you read this context, Satan is the, the force kind of behind. He's the one who influenced, whether it be through pride or whatever means. In this context, Satan the adversary somehow incites David to make an unauthorized census of the people against God's wishes. And of course, the wise advice of the commander Joab, David goes along with this. As a result, God is greatly displeased. And listen to this, 70,000 Israelites perish here because of what David did and because of Satan inciting, say, tempting David to do that. You see, the he in 1 Samuel 24, 1, although capitalized in some translations, that's Satan, not God. 
Satan is the one who incited, influenced, encouraged, tempted David to go and number Israel. Why would David do that? Pride, probably. How many people do we have? How many men do we have to fight in war? How big are we? How powerful are we? How much can we do? The emphasis began to be on born the men, the, the warriors, the fighters, the chariots, the horsemen, the, the cavalry, and not on God. That's where David went astray in this. And as a result, Satan influenced him. And look at that. 70,000 people died because of the influence of Satan that day. Friend, if you don't think Satan is destructive, if you don't think Satan wants murder and violence and mayhem, just read First Sam just read First Chronicles 21, the whole chapter, all the way to the end, and you'll see the violence. You'll see the every every crime, every rape, every every murder, every thievery, every violent crime that you can think of. I will promise you this. Satan stands in the background and applauds that. That's what he wants to happen because he knows it hurts God and it hurts his creation. All right. Fourth appearance of Satan in Scripture. Open your Bible to Zechariah chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. This is the fourth appearance of Satan. And I want you to notice the oppositional role that Satan is here in. Here's what the Scripture says. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. Now watch this. And Satan standing at the right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? In this context, Satan is standing next to the angel of the Lord. And listen to this. He's standing there to oppose him. He wants Israel. He wants their destruction. He doesn't want the restoration and the re all that's going to happen to take place and, and Israel to get back with God. And so God rebukes him for that effort. Friend, this is a good picture of Satan's attempt to thwart God's plan from an adversarial role. This might actually be what's referenced in Jude 9 where uh, Michael rebukes the devil trying to take advantage of, trying to, uh, about the body of Moses. The body of Moses, according to Acts chapter 7, was the Israelites as well, just like the body of Christ is the church today. But whatever the case be, here you see him in an oppositional role, trying to thwart God's plan, trying to hurt Israel, and trying to stop good from happening. Now let's turn to the New Testament. The next appearance of Satan in Scripture is found in Matthew chapter 4 at the temptation of Christ. Look at this account with me. Look in Matthew chapter 4, and let's see what Satan is doing in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he said to him, All these things I'll give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Here we see how Satan works. At Jesus' most vulnerable point, when he's been in the wilderness, without food, 40 days, there with the wild beasts, Satan runs Jesus through the gambit of temptation. The Lord, he remains resolute and overcomes Satan's temptations, but to show how cunning Satan is, he even tries to use the Word of God against Jesus. But listen to the three names that are mentioned here about Satan. He is called the tempter. He's the one, as we mentioned, who's trying to tempt us 
entice us to do evil. He's called the devil, Diablos, the great, the, 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 the one who's uh, wild and unharnessed, unbridled, out of control is the idea. Then, of course, Satan, the adversary. And then as we think about these appearances of Satan in Scripture, the names help us to understand more about his nature. The Greek word for tempter is paradzon. That word means one who tries to tempt or entice someone uh, used in the negative sense of the devil's efforts to entice Christians to fall and fail. He's going to throw it out in front of you. The temptation that allures you the most, the devil's going to plop it out there. The devil, the Greek word diabolos, is an accuser or a slanderer, uh, a false accuser, one who utters accusations, sometimes based on hearsay, rumors, or intentional lies that are undocumented, unproven, with the intent of doing harm or discrediting others. Did God really say you shouldn't do this? That's not why. God didn't want you to do it because He didn't want you to be like Him. The accuser, the slanderer was there. And then, of course, as we've mentioned, Satan, Satanas, he's the adversary, the enemy, one who hates God, hates Christians, and good, and wants to see evil and us fail in this world. Now, we have some other appearances of Satan that are more figurative, in a sense, we might say, but they still stand out in the New Testament. Luke chapter 22, verse 3. John chapter 13, verse 2. The Bible says that Satan entered Judas's heart and enticed him to betray Jesus for money. We know Judas had a problem with money, for in John we learn that he was dipping into the bag that the disciples carried around, taking money out for himself. And so when you think of Satan as the tempter, those 30 pieces of silver, that wasn't some temptation that Judas didn't already have already. Satan knew what Judas's problem was, and those 30 pieces of silver got into his heart. Satan entered Judas's heart, the Bible tells us. Um, Satan at one point wanted to have complete control over Peter and the vulnerable state he was in after he was in a state where he's going to, his faith is going to be tested as Jesus is about to go on trial. Luke 22, verse 31 and 32, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. And so even Peter, Satan worked in his heart. His cowardice, I don't know if it, even cowardice is the right word, his uh, uh, desire not to die, his desire was there to follow Jesus, but he didn't want to be put on a cross also, and Satan gets him to deny the Lord through that. You see visions of Satan in the New Testament trying to thwart God's scheme of redemption, Revelation chapter 12, the woman, the dragon, the whole picture there. He's identified as the great dragon, the accuser of the brethren, uh, the devil, the serpent of old, and the deceiver of the whole world. My friend, as you think about this idea and these visions of Satan, ultimately I want you to see him in his ultimate demise. Satan is not going to win in the end. Look in your Bible, if you would, in Revelation chapter 20. When I think about Satan... I think about his ultimate demise and what his outcome is going to be. And friend, if you give yourself over to Satan, you give in to his temptation and his wiles, it's not going to be pretty in the end. Listen to Revelation chapter 20, verses 10 through 15. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades lived up the dead who were in them. They were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast in a lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast in a lake of fire. Satan, the beast, the false prophet, his angels cast in a lake of fire. Eternal torment forever and ever, no end. Those who follow him, those who have not died to self, obeyed the gospel, gone through the second death, death, burial, and resurrection in the watery grave of baptism, Romans 6, 1 through 4, they're going to go where he went. Those who don't remain faithful, they're going to live with the devil forever. And so Satan's ultimate demise is 
He's already lost. He's going to be destroyed forever. All he's got left is to do as much harm as possible right now. Don't let him do that in your life and mind. You know, when I see Satan in the Bible, in his current wounded state, headed down the road to destruction, here's the best picture. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Oh, open your Bible to this. This is Satan's current wounded state and what he's doing. 1 Peter chapter 5. Listen to what the Bible says in verse number 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Satan is here seen as that ravenous, destructive, tear you apart type of lion. This is the image of Satan we need to be reminded of today. Jesus dealt the death blow to Satan at the cross. Hebrews 2.14 Jesus, through death, overcame him who had the power of death, which is Satan, and released those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. At the cross, Jesus dealt the ultimate death blow to Satan. Now, we see that Satan's ultimate demise is at the end of time, he and all his workers, all his followers, are going to be cast into the lake of fire of eternal torment. Between the cross and now, the cross and the end of time, is all he's got left. He's working as hard and as aggressively and as militantly like a, a roaring lion seeking who may devour. And friend, we've got to make sure we don't give in. He wants you to go to hell. It is not going to be a good place. You see, here's what we miss about hell. Hell is the devil's torment also. Hell is the devil's punishment. There's this idea that the devil's going to be the king of hell. The devil's not the king of hell. Hell is his punishment too. He wants you to suffer with him. Don't give in to that. Be faithful unto death, Jesus said. You'll receive the crown of life. And so we encourage you to join us next time as we're going to study more about the gospel of Christ. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.